Hi, my name is Esmani. I'm one of Miss Renata's students. Um, I was one of her students when she was coming inside the detention center. I've been going to the detention center since I was 12 years old. Um, I mean, my mom passed when I was 11, so that's when the troubling in my life started. I started not caring. Just thought life was over. I was just out here doing what I wanted to do. Hang with the wrong people. You know, I was just not caring. But once I got to the detention center, a couple times they'll let you go. They'll let you go and go, but at a certain time they'll get you and you have to spend a couple of days and that's you go to court. And one day I went in there and it was a Tuesday and I met Miss Renata. And she sat down and talked to all of the girls. She cut jokes, but in between the jokes she was letting us know like, to change our life, it's not over, we are someone. She used to read us books, she made books on the detention center as well. She used a couple students. She just a big influence on a lot of women life or youth life just like me. Um, at the time I didn't listen to Miss Renata, I just used to let it go in one ear out the other. But now that I'm facing a two year sentence inside prison, it has really like affected me. It has made me open my eyes to everything Miss Renata was telling me wasn't to hurt me, it was to help me. But Sometimes people got to see it for themselves, and I was one of the people. And today at 6 o'clock, I will be turning myself in to do the two-year bid. Hopefully, when I go in there, I, I do right, and they'll cut the time down. But it's, it's, there's no for sure they'll do it. So I got to just face the consequences for the actions that I did. And hopefully, by some of the youth seeing my video, they can take what I'm saying and run with it. They, they won't have to go through what I'm going through but then again it's going to be a couple that look at my video and say okay yeah uh, whatever still do what they want to do still hang out and then they're going to be in my shoes and hopefully somebody there like Miss Renata to let them tell their story to other people. What's up this your girl Darian from Views from the Streets episode 5 I'm here with your girl Renata Hennis the hope dealer. How are you doing today? I'm well how are you? That's what's up I'm good I'm good. So, tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you come up with the name Hope Dealer? In 2010, I was working at William and Moran's High School uh, with a nonprofit organization, which I still work there during um, the day. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of my students, I noticed a trend of them being arrested, uh, going to jail, some of them ultimately going to prison. I've had students murdered. Um, so what I decided to do in 2010 was set out to write a book titled P.S. Never Give Up Hope. I got the title Hope. My and Everything that I do is surrounded about giving young people hope. In one of my interviews at a Florida State prison where juveniles are housed, I asked one of the young men who's serving a life sentence, what gives you hope? And he told me, some days I have no hope. So after that, I coined the term or the phrase P.S never give up hope right. and kind of self-titled myself the hope dealer. Positive, very positive. Um, how do you feel about the recent police shootings that have been going on around? Police brutality, I think now in the age of technology and social media, is huge, but it's something that's been going on. Right. Um, I think something that upsets me most is that it's people get so upset nationally about it, but here, right here in Duval County, these shootings that are justified, that are, uh, there's, n no one is ever charged, the victims are unarmed. Right. I believe that investigations for police sh shootings need to be transparent to the public. Right. I think that we need to have a more positive relationship with the police, especially in urban communities. Right. Uh, I think that there's a disparity or a gap between those policing and those being policed. Okay. Um, perhaps that relationship between, again, those being policed and those doing the policing can get better. And until then, I think these is these incidents and shootings will continue to occur. Okay. Okay. What about uh, Black Lives Matter? What does that mean to you? I think. The Black Lives Matter campaign has raised a lot of awareness. It's definitely not just a hashtag. Mm -hmm. It's something that has 
caused a, a paradigm shift in not just us realizing that our lives matter, but our counterparts respecting that our lives matter right. as well. Right. So I believe in it. Um, I definitely utilize the hashtag, and I think it's raising awareness to what's going on in urban communities across the nation. Okay. I hear a lot of people say that, um, you know, people scream uh, Black Lives Matter. And so it's, it's funny that you're saying that it is a, a people aware. But from what I'm hearing, just from my peers, people around, um, no one is doing nothing. They say, hey, I'm shot, we cry about it. Once we cry about it, we march. Once we march, it's done. So do you feel that way or? I think there are a lot of people doing a lot of things. I think we need to do a better job um, rather than having a, a lot of silos and islands of coming together and uniting. Right. There are a lot of groups that do marches and protests, but the work is I myself, I mentor young people, I advocate for young people who are incarcerated. So I have attended protests, I have uh, participated in marches, I have participated in sit-ins. Uh, in 2013, uh, when the, in the Trayvon Martin acquittal, uh, I went to Tallahassee and I joined a group called the Dream Defenders. I'm not a part of the Dream Defenders per se, but they were there and they shut down the state capitol for 31 days. Okay. So I spent the night in the capitol and a, a large part of what they wanted was just for the governor to hear them out. And they drafted, they actually drafted a bill. So they actually drafted legislation. They talked to legislators. Okay. They advocate. So there are groups doing things. We have a group here locally, uh, shout out to Florida New Majority. Um, and they do a lot of ex-offender work or so that repeat offenders, once they are released from prison, can come back into society and re-enter society. Um, they advocate for them to get their voter rights back. So there are pieces of it. To, it, it, it takes everybody. Okay. It, it, it's not just a march. Right. The march is just a to raise awareness and to get the information that all the parties involved to see who is serious about the, the task at hand and who's going to go move forward with making those uh, completing the agenda, whatever that may be. <laughs> okay, awesome. Um, so, I hear you have a book. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about it? I do. I interviewed 10 young men and women. Again, I started that back in 2011. Mm -hmm. um, and I published it in 2013. Mm -hmm. um, I traveled to a lot of Florida prisons and I interviewed them because I can talk to young people all day and tell them, don't commit crime, make good decisions, choose your friends wisely, uh, walk away from certain situations. But I think it's better heard from those who are actually have lived it, are right. living it, and are dealing with the consequences of their actions in their youth. Mm -hmm. um, so like I said, the young man that told me he didn't have hope, Free Eddie. His <laughs> name is Jonathan Hartley. He's serving a life sentence. Jonathan is about 22 now. He told me that, you know, this is no place for young people. I've been here since I was, he's been locked up since he was 14 years old. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that happened back in 2009, I believe, in his freshman year at Lee High School here in the city. Uh, and young people need to see that because it's not a joke. It's not cliche. It's not something that's just on television. It's real. And it's people who are, have, are here from our city who are who are hard affected by these young people. And I want all people to live to their full potential. And I wish that I could have talked to the young people that are in my book prior to them being there, but I couldn't. But now that I have reached them, hopefully their messages are reaching other young people. Right, right. Um, what is the name of the book again? It's called P.S. Never Give Up Hope. Oh, awesome. So do you have any other projects that you're working, currently working on right now or in the future? I do anticipate releasing my second title. It's a nonfiction book and it's about young, it's about incarcerated women and how men play a role in their incarceration. Okay. So I started working on that a long break and I'm just now getting back into the groove of writing. Well, you guys, there you have it, Renata Hannes. She is the Hope Dealer, and make sure you pick up her book, P.S. Never Give Up Hope. Never Give Up Hope. It's your girl from The Views from the Streets. Y'all take care. This is episode five. Peace. Views from the Streets, what's happening? I'm your host, Zoe, sitting alongside criminal defense attorney, Ashley Goggins. 
Hey, what's up, everybody? How you doing? I'm doing good. Good to be here. Thank you for coming on the show. Not a problem. Okay, so what inspired you to become a lawyer? Well, um, I was going to go get my master's in business administration, and I just learned through research that being a lawyer, I pretty much have... I can do anything I want to do at my liberty, so I felt like, you know, I might as well just go to law school. I can do both, so I went to law school, did both. I had no aspirations of growing up to become a lawyer or anything like that. I just knew that the opportunities that um, would open up to me as becoming a lawyer, so that's why I decided to do So you went from Rains High School to <laughs> FAMU, and I know I'm missing one. Um, law school, I went to Stetson. How was that? Um, it's a cultural shock. Um, I went from, you know, historically black high school to historically black um, college to dominantly white law school. So it was not a lot of lawyers that looked like me. It was a culture shock. I mean, I, I did go to First Coast 9th through 11th and it was, it was not like it is now, but just those eight years of just being around people who looked like me. Um, with law school, you're with people who uh, their dinner tables and talk about different conversations that right. me and my parents talked about. So I felt that for two years, I was playing catch up, learning what they learned when they were growing up. Pretty much just had to play catch up. So it was a challenge until like my final year. Especially coming from FAMU. <laughs> I mean, I learned what I needed to learn at FAMU. But yeah, it was a, it was a culture shock. It was different. The atmosphere was different. So like a normal day for a lawyer, like what's that like? Um, well, it depends on felony court. So my judge starts at 930. So, I mean, we got to be there at 930. We get there around 830 to talk to the prosecutors about the cases, what we're going to work out, what we're going to set for trial and things like that. So we're in court pretty much half of the morning. We get out around 11. Um, we all go to lunch. After lunch, we either have our afternoon meetings, our depositions. So we have a small window when we're actually in our office sitting down based on the work that I do. So the half in the morning, I'm in court working, running around, um, negotiating cases, um, talking to clients. And then the bottom half, we're just in pretrial mode where we are talking to witnesses of cases, talking to police officers about their findings and that's pretty much it. And the rest will be answering the telephone calls from my clients. What was one of your toughest cases? I know you can't go into details mm -hmm. about it, but... Um, I would say outside of... I handle now, I handle uh, sex cases. So those sex. are... Gen <laughs> like, yeah, sex, we call them sex cases um, in the Special Assault Division. And it's pretty much um, molestation, sexual batteries, rape cases, um, child pornography, things like that. Those are hard for me. Um, but I would say my toughest case is, is I started off as a juvenile attorney um, and to see my boys, I call them my boys, to see them come back as an adult and meet me in felony, it's tough seeing them because you saw them when it was 14 and 15 and 16 and you tell them, you know, you don't want to go upstairs in a Duval County Courthouse we call upstairs felony. You don't want to come upstairs, the time is nothing like it is in juvenile. So just to see, because I've been there for a while now, I'm just seeing cases come back. My juveniles, they're up there in felony with me. And it's like, you're not looking at probation now. You're looking at 20 years and it's really nothing I can do for you, you know? They can't cop a bill. You know, they say a lot of people snitching and stuff these days. <laughs> How they sign up for that? Like, what they do? Like, um, I don't know. But some of these snitches might want to know. <laughs> so you can tell um, Pretty them much to cooperate with the state. You know, the detectives just have to want the information from you. You can uh, cooperate on the way to the jailhouse when you're getting arrested. You can cooperate. You can write the detectives. I mean, it's real easy to cooperate, but the officers and the detectives have to want the information. So everybody down there can't testify. And I say the first person to talk get the best deal. So if it's a lot of y'all, you got to do what you got to do. For y'all snitches. Talk first. I mean, that's what y'all choose to do. I'm not saying do that, but and neither am I. Do whatever you gotta do, but don't come over on this show snitching. We don't want to hear. I was just doing an interview. <laughs> but nah, outside of being a lawyer, what else you have going on? Um, well, I'm the owner of the Credit Bar. Business is an individual established personal credit and business credit. So if you need to prepare or you want to establish a business and get your business credit, then you can contact the credit bar um, at www.mycreditbar.com or you can contact me at hello at mycreditbar.com.
Thank you very much. You can get your credit repair. You heard all the information from the lawyer, credit bar. Thank you for coming on Views from the no Streets. Problem, no I'm your host, Zoe. And I'm Ashley. And we are out. I represent the bank all day, downtown in the heart of this shit, the fundamentals and the basics, you know what I'm saying? My mission is to have 20 million listening, waiting, and anticipating my command. My poetic leadership is so advanced, I'm a threat. Equipped with the necessary means to manifest our black dreams initiated from the chosen. We need another exit dust, I'm the next Moses. This revolutionary shit gon' make them crackers wanna kill me. I'ma be busting back out of ventilating fury and fuck making it to the jury. If these first hundred rounds ain't enough, I got more shots surely. Victims of the struggle, so we openly protesting. Bang at the popos in the process. We politically neglected children. That's why we ride and get it crunk if you niggas feel me. Don't deny this real shit, let it be known. I'm the motherfucker that's suitable for the throne, and you niggas gon' crown me. Yeah, ain't no motherfucking doubt niggas gon' crown me. I got this cheap shit poppin' in the continuous rotation. I do it for the love, niggas love me back, greet me with standing ovations. My street lingo mixed with conscious quotations, designed specifically to induce elevation. I'm dedicated to the struggle, I pledge allegiance to see us free and offer my life absolutely. My greatest contribution sealed with my blood, I'm the realest in the field and I do it just because I can feel the pain and hurting whenever thugs cry. They got me up here with this last shirt, they know I drank a lot now, so that's why my shit tight right here. Don't trust no chick that messing with your dog, that law. If you come up, don't forget about your dog, that law. I'm a street, so it's the law. If you broke, that should be against